Hi students, welcome to Digestive System Lecture Part 3. If you recall, in Part 2, we left off learning about the small intestines, the modification, or the modifications, plural rather, of the small intestine to assist with absorption of nutrients. So, so far you've seen pictures of the small intestines in your book, but you haven't yet seen what it looks like underneath a microscope, the histology. So I'll just remind you of some of the basics first. If we look at the layers uh, that we find in the gastrointestinal tract, all layers are found here in the small intestines as, as well. So you've got the mucosa, and remember, it would have three sublayers to it, although they're all three are not very obvious. They would have epithelium. They would have um, a basal, actually, we'll call it lamina propria, and then the last one would be muscularis mucosa, right? So all three of those sublayers would be found in the mucosa. And then uh, superficial to that, all of this would be submucosa. And all of this would be the muscularis externa. And then there would be a very thin layer of serosa or I'd prefer you call it visceral peritoneum. So all of those layers are present. We learned in the second lecture about the projections of the mucosa called villi, and they are pretty distinct here, although I've drawn all over them. Uh, here's a nice one. Here's one villus. Here would be another and another. Remember, they help to increase the surface area for absorption. And then also here you can see one of those intestinal crypts. If we go to the next slide, if this is on a greater magnification, you can still see the villi, although um, the name has been lost here. And you then have a much better view of those intestinal crypts that create that intestinal juice. Another thing I just want to point out to you that's pretty easy to see is the simple columnar epithelial tissue. I'll outline a nice section of it right here. But all of that would be the simple columnar that makes up the epithelium of the mucosa. And then um, superficial to that or just underneath that, then all of that would be lamina propria. And down here would be that muscularis mucosa. So you can pretty clearly see all three of the layers of the mucosa here. Now we're going to move on to an organ that is not part of the GI tract, not part of the tube, but rather it's an accessory organ or an accessory structure. And this is an organ, a gland rather, called the pancreas. And the pancreas, you can pretty clearly see the stomach is right here. You can see the shape of the stomach. But you can also see that uh, the pancreas lies posterior to the stomach or dorsal to the stomach. Here would be that greater curvature of the stomach. And then immediately posterior to it would be this entire structure right here that we know is the pancreas. It stretches pretty much across the body. The spleen would be somewhere over here. And the duodenum, of course, is right here. The structure of the pancreas is such that it's both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland at the same time. So remember, endocrine glands secrete hormones. So the endocrine cells of the pancreas, they secrete two hormones called insulin and glucagon. And uh, the exocrine portion of the, 
pancreas, or the exocr exocrine glands of the pancreas, secrete what we call pancreatic juice or pancreatin. I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is here in a second. Nonetheless, um, those secretions make their way. Let me get a good pen here. Those secretions make their way uh, through the pancreatic duct. So here's this long duct that you see right here, pancreatic duct. And then it's going to lead to the duodenum. Remember earlier in lecture two, I mentioned that the duodenum acts as a, a chemical mixing bowl. So imagine a chyme leaving the stomach and making its way into the duodenum. And that pancreas then is going to have its secretions that it sends into the duodenum to aid in chemical digestion. I apologize for the formatting here. Um, I still think you can understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the pancreas, remember, said I said that it secretes what we call pancreatic juice. And that's a mix of enzymes to help with chemical digestion of food. And also buffers like sodium bicarbonate. Remember the pH of the stomach is somewhere around 2? When that chyme leaves the stomach and makes its way into the duodenum, it's still at a pH of 2, and that's pretty low. So the sodium bicarb that the pancreas secretes increases the increases pH somewhere up closer to 6 so that that really low pH doesn't damage the um, intestines. Um, pancreatic juice is made up of, like I mentioned earlier, um, enzymes. So there's one called pancreatic amylase that breaks down starch into a smaller sugar called maltose. The lipase that it secretes, uh, you probably can guess what lipase, lipase does. It breaks down lipids into fatty acids and uh, glycerol. Proteases are going to break down proteins and polypeptides into small polypeptides and tri and di peptides. Nucleases are going to digest RNA and DNA into their nucleotide components. And then as I mentioned, uh, sodium bicarbonate, not an enzyme, just a buffer, is going to neutralize the acidic chyme uh, coming from the stomach. We're gonna move on now to another accessory organ, which is the liver. And um, this is one of the largest organs in the body, kind of minus the skin, I guess you could say. And its structure is such that it's made of four different lobes. I'll show you the lobes here in a second. There is a, the largest of the lobes is the right lobe. And then of course the left lobe and it's divided by a piece of connective tissue called the falciform ligament. It's not a ligament in the true sense that it anchors bone to bone. This is just a connective tissue structure holding the two lobes together. If you were to look at a posterior view of the liver over here on the right, you're able to see the remaining lobes there is what we call the caudate lobe right here and then the quadrate lobe so those are the four lobes of the liver if we were to look at the liver underneath the microscope we see that the Liver itself is made up of specialized liver cells called hepatocytes. Hepato means liver. And they're arranged in a very particular manner. They come together to make what we call lobules, little lobes. So lobules are these hexagonal shaped structures with the... Um, the brown cells here being the hepatocytes. They're over here too. I was just trying not to draw too much on this one. But all of these cells are the hepatocytes. 
One of the main functions of the liver is to filter blood. Filtering the blood that's coming directly from the GI tract. You might think that when you absorb nutrients, those nutrients travel directly to the blood vessels and then the heart immediately transports those nutrients and anything else that's been absorbed to the rest of the body. But that is um, absolutely not the case. The body's kind of got a a fail safe here or a monitor in the liver in that the blood that's being drained from the small intestines that's going to be high in nutrients and anything else that's been absorbed goes directly to the liver first it makes a pit stop in the liver and the liver is going to modify that blood it's going to detoxify that blood and ensure that that blood has the proper um, contents or the proper concentration of enzymes and nutrients and um, doesn't contain uh, things that are toxic like alcohol or um, it can um, also monitor the blood for any pathogens you may have ingested. So that brings me to the other structures making up the lobule of the liver and those are the blood vessels. So what you can see here in blue Let's see, they didn't name it. I'll name it for you. At each one of the corners, right here, these blue blood vessels, those are a branch of what we call the hepatic portal vein. When we get to the um, cardiovascular system, I'll teach you more about that. This is just a small branch of what we call the hepatic portal vein. Oops. And this vein is carrying blood directly from the GI tract into the liver. So each one of these blood vessels right here is carrying blood that's nutrient rich from the GI tract into the liver. And that blood is going to pass down these blood vessels right here called sinusoids. And these sinusoids, they don't show it to you, but these sinusoids are really leaky blood vessels. Think of them as uh, canals, where um, a canal or a drainage ditch doesn't have a, a top to it, but it's got the water flowing down it. And when we have a flood, the water flows over the sides of that drainage canal. That's kind of what happens here with the sinusoids, is that as the blood travels down those sinusoids, um, it's going to uh, overflow the sinusoids and the blood then is going to um, be modified by these hepatocytes. And that blood takes kind of a casual journey um, through all of these sinusoids right down to a structure that we call the central vein. So think of that central vein as being the drain in your bathtub. So that central vein is collecting uh, blood from all of these sinusoids. And from that central vein, all of the central vein of all of the central veins of all of the liver lobules all come together to create what we call the hepatic vein. And that's the main vein that drains the liver and sends that modified blood into your blood vessels. So think of that blood as have from your GI tract that's carrying nutrients and anything else you absorbed, traveling to the liver, being modified in the liver and detoxified in the liver, and then draining out of the liver and then going into circulation. So along the way, this picture over here on the right doesn't have the sinusoids, but uh, we can still imagine it without it. We've got blood traveling down in this direction through those sinusoids, and it overflows, kind of marinates these hepatocytes. And as that blood is covering or, or being modified by those hepatocytes, the hepatocytes are also secreting uh, products, enzymes, etc., into the sinusoids so that the blood that makes its way down these central veins is uh, detoxified and modified.
alleles. If we go back to here, and let me erase all this business that I drew. You can pretty easily see the hepatic triads at each corner, right? So you know what the branch of the hepatic portal vein is bringing to the liver lobules. And you know that, um... oh, here we go. This is a much better picture. I apologize for getting ahead of myself. So again, we've got blood coming in from the GI tract up this way and it's going to travel slowly down the sinusoids. That blood's going to uh, overflow the banks of the sinusoids, for instance, and then be modified by these hepatocytes. Those hepatocytes then will, um, um, will send some products back into, the, into that blood, right? absorb some products and keep some products out of the blood. So modified um, products are being essentially sent back into the sinusoids. And that blood just continues on and makes its way down that central vein. Another main function of the liver is to produce bile. And bile is a product that helps to emulsify fats, or you could say lipids. Emulsify means to essentially dissolve or break down. Bile is made um, by the hepatocytes and then travels down these what we call bile canaliculi and that bile leaves the liver through what we call bile ducts. And all of those bile ducts drain bile from the liver and then that liver, or sorry, that um, bile gets stored in the gallbladder. So the liver makes the bile, but the gallbladder stores it. So before I forget, let me erase some of this stuff. And let me explain one other thing to you. And that's uh, what a hepatic triad is. Uh, so if you think about that phrase, it's a triad, so it's going to be made of three structures. Uh, the hepatic triad is made up of a bile duct, one of the branches of the hepatic portal vein, and a branch of the hepatic artery. So you'll see these hepatic triads at each corner of the liver. bile duct is draining the... Um, is draining bile down to the gallbladder. But what we haven't, uh, I haven't discussed with you yet, is um, the branch of the hepatic artery, which is this red structure that you see here. That blood that's being brought up from the GI tract through the branch of the hepatic portal vein is low in oxygen. So these living cells, these living hepatocytes here, they still need to have oxygen. So the um, branch of the hepatic artery is bringing um, oxygenated blood to the cells themselves. This kind of uh, blood that uh, just helps to um, helps the cells with everything they need to carry out their daily functions. Underneath a microscope, all these structures are pretty obvious. So um, let's see, this entire structure right here is a liver lobule and you've got the central vein in the center the hepatocytes are the structures that you see stained pink so if we look at the picture up in the left hand corner um, each one of these are hepatocytes and the white streaks in between those are the sinusoids Um, what else can we see in this picture? Oh, yes, we can see a hepatic triad pretty easily. So here's a branch of the hepatic portal vein. Here are bile ducts, and here is a branch of the hepatic artery. So you can see that hepatic triad pretty easily. 
So let's have a closer look at how bile is removed from the bladder. Or sorry, not the bladder, pardon me. How bile is removed from the liver or drains from the liver. All of those little bile canaliculi, they um, drain to these two main ducts. So you see the left hepatic duct and the right hepatic duct. And they merge to become a structure. Let me get rid of this over here. They merge to become a structure called the common hepatic duct. That's this structure that you see here. And that common hepatic duct collects bile from the left and right hepatic ducts and it will carry that bile up through the cystic duct and then that bile gets stored within the gallbladder. Both the cystic duct and that common hepatic duct, you can see if I erase my lines here, give me a sec. So all of those ducts, uh, the cystic duct right here and the common hepatic duct, they eventually merge together, you see right here, and they become one single duct called the common bile duct. And it's that common bile duct that you can see right here is going to drain uh, that bile into the duodenum. Let's go ahead and look at some of the functions of the liver. There are over 200, so obviously we're not going to discuss excuse me, discuss all of them here. We'll just um, discuss a few of them. As I mentioned, the liver produces bile and it excretes that bile. But one of the things the liver also does is it stores uh, glucose in its stored form called glycogen. And think of um, the importance of this. The liver acts as a metabolic regulator, ensuring that glucose stays stable. So the concentration of your of blood glucose doesn't ever decrease significantly or increase significantly. It's always stable. So imagine not having a liver, for instance, and eating a um, bag of Skittles. And all of that sugar goes from your small intestine. All of that, um, all that sugar goes from your small intestines directly into your bloodstream. Think of the homeostatic imbalance that might result. You'd have this rush of sugar into your blood, and that would cause a number of uh, issues with your blood. But in addition to that, your cells can't use all of that glucose all at once. So it would be a really inefficient way to regulate or to, um, to utilize energy if you get these rushes, these highs or these high concentrations of glucose and then glucose falls, etc. So in that respect, the liver acts as a, a metabolic regulator. It also helps to regulate the amount of fatty acids that we find in the blood as well. Some of the fat-soluble vitamins and minerals. So really the liver is kind of acting as a, um, like I said, as a, as a monitor for the blood, constantly monitoring blood concentrations and modifying blood concentrations of um, energy and other, um, other products that your cells need. So that blood makes a pit stop in the liver, the liver modifies that blood, ensures glucose um, is in the appropriate concentration, fatty acids are present in your blood, fat-soluble vitamins and minerals, everything that you need um, is in the appropriate concentrations prior to that blood going into general circulation. Another function of the liver is to uh, is the interconversion of nutrients. So this means creating glucose out of other major macromolecules. So the liver has the ability to, um, from protein, make glucose, or from uh, lipids, also make glucose. 
Recall from your Gen Bio classes that glucose is the preferred form of energy for mitochondria in your cells. So if there isn't enough glucose present, the liver has the ability to make glucose from proteins and lipids to ensure that your cells are constantly getting the nutrients that they need. Another function of the liver is uh, detoxification and removal of drugs that may be ingested, any toxins that you may have ingested through something you ate or drank, and um, breaking down hormones that have already been used. Lastly, the liver uh, carries out what we call hematological regulation. So that means breaking down old or worn out red blood cells and then recycling the components of those red blood cells where possible and the phagocytosis of um, any bacteria that have made their way in or any other pathogens. And then also with hematological regulation, that includes the synthesis or the making or the creating of plasma proteins. Remember that plasma is the watery component of blood and there are proteins dissolved in that plasma that carry out a number of functions. Those functions you'll learn about when you get to your physiology class. In the earlier slides, when we were learning about the lobules and the sinusoids, I have already mentioned all of these, these things to you, the blood supply to the liver. So you can read this slide. Um, it's just a review of what we covered uh, previously. Let's move on then to the last organ of the GI tract. So remember that the, the pancreas and the liver, those were accessory organs. They're not part of the GI tract. There, were, there was no food or drink passing through either one of those organs. So we're going back now to the very last part um, of the GI tract, the most distal part, and that's the large intestine. The large intestine is sometimes also referred to the colon, so it just kind of depends on um, your setting, but either term is appropriate. The colon begins at the, where the ileum ends. So here's the last section of the small intestine, the ileum. And you see where that ileum connects directly to the colon. And the ileum is going to release its contents into the colon via this little structure, structure right there. It's actually a sphincter. It's called the ileocecal sphincter or the ileocecal valve. So, um... What's coming from the small intestines is chyme, so kind of this greenish goo, and that makes its way through the ileocecal valve into this first section of the small intestines, this little pouch that's called the cecum. From there, that chyme is just going to make its way around the colon or large intestine through different distinct sections. So I guess I'll use blue. That chyme is going to travel up the ascending colon. It then makes a turn here and travels across the body through the transverse colon, makes a downward turn through the descending colon, and then makes its way into what we call the sigmoid colon, and then ultimately down to where um, feces are stored in the rectum. So really the large intestine is creating um, a hard, compact, um, solid waste material that we know as feces. And one of the ways in which it's doing that is that it is uh, reabsorbing water from chyme. The chyme that comes from the ileum, oops, I should have made that green, everything else, all the chyme was green too. So that chyme is coming from the ileum and it, <laughs> it's quite watery. And our bodies are pretty good at um, conserving water. So that chyme that's real watery as it makes its way through the GI tract here, the or sorry, the colon, that water is gonna get reabsorbed into these blood vessels right here. 
the large intestines, even though they're not carrying out um, absorption of nutrients, they're largely responsible for a lot of the water that we reabsorb. So the large intestines are really well vascularized, just like everywhere else along the GI tract. In fact, um, individuals who are ill and, or, and can't take medication or children that won't accept medication or individuals who are nauseous and will vomit medication, oftentimes, um, and don't get grossed out, but oftentimes a medication in suppository form can be put into or inserted into the rectum. And uh, that suppository then will gradually kind of dissolve and its products can leak into the blood vessels here and act as a method of absorbing medication into the bloodstream without it having to go through the mouth, the esophagus, or the uh, stomach. So anyway, that's just a clinical um, a clinical application of that knowledge. And lastly, I want to draw your attention to this thing right here. That's called the appendix. And the appendix is, as you probably know, a structure that we don't have to have to live. We can live without it. And um, inside of that appendix, it's not solid. It's got a little space on the inside. Inside of that appendix will be bacteria that um, we can carry around with us, so to speak, wherever we go. Those, this actually kind of acts like a bacterial storehouse so that when necessary, uh, some of those bacteria can um, make their way into the large intestine, kind of repopulate the large intestine with certain bacteria uh, that are necessary depending on what your body needs. Had we had more time in class, I would have really loved to gone over the um, functions of some of the gut, the, 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 the bacteria that live in the colon. The bacteria that live in the colon are incredibly important for synthesizing some vitamins that um, uh, we, we need to get from our diet. Those bacteria are also really important for overall health, just like they were in the small intestines and in the stomach, and um, those bacteria that you carry around with you in your colon aren't always, um, they're not always maintained in very specific uh, ratios. So for instance, if you were to take an antibiotic, you're probably going to kill some of the bacteria right here in the colon, right? And we know that, that those bacteria, most of them are good guys. There's this constant fight between good bacteria and bad bacteria in your colon. The good bacteria carry out a number of services for you. But when you take an antibiotic, um, the antibiotic often um, doesn't do much discriminating between good bacteria and bad bacteria. So my point is that um, the bacteria in here in the appendix can uh, reseed or repopulate the colon with the appropriate bacteria when necessary. So you're carrying around a bacterial storage facility, essentially. Okay, so I kind of already <laughs> got ahead of myself again and talked about these functions, but I'll just read them to you. Main functions, water reabsorption. Uh, absorption of some vitamins and minerals, vitamins and vitamins that some of the the bacteria of the colon make, and also probably most obviously is the formation of fecal material as water is reabsorbed from chyme, and temporary storage of that fecal material. As a reminder, there's no chemical digestion here, no enzymatic digestion. There aren't any enzymes working on that. Uh, the chyme, what comes from the, the chyme that comes from the small intestines is pretty much um, just waste product. There isn't much left for the body to absorb on its own. Some of the bacteria, like I mentioned before, in the colon can take those waste products in, in chyme and um, produce things like vitamins, 
but the body, the human body itself, isn't doing any more chemical digestion. The large intestines are still lined with simple columnar epithelium, with the exception of stratified squamous right at the anal canal. Like the small intestines, there are no plicae circularis or villi. So this kind of tells you like, hey, you don't see those folds, the submucosa and the mucosa anymore. So this structure isn't as adept at absorbing nutrients, although it still will reabsorb water. We, we see modifications in the muscularis externa and in the serosa. The muscularis externa, the outer longitudinal layer, which earlier wrapped all the way around the uh, small intestines, now has been reduced to this The modification, oops, 